First responders, preparing for the journey. That's the theme for this year's Men's Weekend, brought to you by the Men's Fellowship Ministry of the historic 12th Baptist Church in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Senior Pastor, the Reverend Dr. Arthur T. Gerald, Jr. Join us Saturday, September 19th from 12 noon till 2 p.m. for an online webinar with six powerful presenters. Reverend Willie Bodrick II, Reverend Jeffrey L. Brown, Dr. Joshua Bartholomew, Missionary Tony Price, Brother Daryl Simpson, Brother Sidney H. Burton Jr., and special guest, Boston Police Commissioner William S. Gross. They'll examine the various roles and preparations needed for being on the front, holding the line, and advancing the good news of Christ Jesus. Registration fee is $15 at the tbcboston.org website. Call 617-442-7855 for more information or email mensfellowship at tbcboston.org. First responders, join us from the comfort and safety of your virtual space as these men put a lens on being on the front, holding the line, and advancing the good news of Christ Jesus. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first responders preparing for the journey. Um, uh, conference. This is the first webinar in a series of presentations that will be coming from uh, the Men's Fellowship at 12th Baptist Church and 12th Baptist Church. Uh, we look forward to a very vigorous um, time of, um, of uh, in this, over these next uh, few minutes. Um, and uh, we have um, eight dynamic uh, panelists with us, with us here this morning. And um, uh, we're going to be hearing from each one of them around this topic uh, first responders preparing for the journey. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, um, holding the line. Um, I'm not going to define any of these items because I'm going to leave that for our panelists to do. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, being on the front line, um, and we're going to be looking at advancing the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, so this is going to be a very uh, dynamic time. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be in a presentation format, so you'll be able to see us and hear us. You'll be able to use the chat on the side of the um, screen to, um, uh, if you open that in your in your Zoom session, to um, type in a question or make a comment. Uh, we won't have time to address every single question um, uh, that's uh, that will be raised, um, but we will um, be looking at them and probably responding to them in a part two. So uh, stay tuned um, and um, you'll see our, our panelists going on and off uh, for various times. Uh, we, we, we're gonna try and only have the person on at that time who's the primary focus um, during the, um, uh, the, the contents. So uh, bear with us um, and we'll, we'll um, give you something that we believe that you will find very invigorating and empowering. So at this time, we'd, we'd like to ask our senior pastor, uh, Reverend Arthur T. Gerald of 12th Baptist Church to um, open us in prayer. Uh, uh, Reverend um, Gerald, if you'd be as so kind. Thank you, sir. Let us pray. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful and thank you for this marvelous day that you've made. We'll rejoice and be glad that we thank you for my brothers who have joined us for this webinar today. We thank you for the gift that you've given us for technology that we're able to come together practicing social distancing from different places, but under this bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ. Now I pray that you bless this particular session today. Bless the leadership, bless the participants. And may every word that is spoken uh, on, be honored by you and blessed by you. We ask you, Lord, to be with each of us and all of us. We thank you particularly for our commissioner of police that's here today. And we ask you, Lord, that you continue to use him with all the issues that he is dealing with as relates to city policing here in Boston. Strengthen him, abide by him, and keep him. And may your grace be sufficient for each of us and all of us as we go forward today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Pastor Gerald. Um, uh, just going, going forward, um, um, as, as you know, uh, I'll repeat for everyone's sake, all the attendees, you'll be able to uh, type a, a question or a comment into the chat section of your Zoom. 
and uh, we'll do our best to address these either today or in a part two. Um, diving right in, um, I've been tasked with being the host. Uh, this is uh, my first time hosting an event such as this, so I'm a little nervous, but I'm, I'm confident that uh, God will provide all of the uh, support that I need. And I'm surrounded by a great group of, 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 of panelists, so I'm not worried about anything. Um, so um, uh, that being said, um, I'm just going to um, tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a, a member of 12th Baptist Church. I've been such for a, a little bit more than 33 years. Um, I served there on a, a number of capacities as the president of the Man's Fellowship and the um, director of the IT department and the, uh, the director of the audio video ministry. Uh, so, um, and I work full time um, in, the, in the area of uh, social services um, as, as a director of an IT department of a social service agency. So um, I, I have a little bit of, 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 of much expect, expectations on myself and I'm just glad to even be here to uh, help bring this group to you in this um, event. So um, the question, what is the question? Um, first responders, what's a first responder? Um, I, I don't know what a first responder is to everybody. It, I think it means a little bit of something different to all and, and depending on different times in, in their day and in their life and in whatever season they're in, what that might be. Might be. When we first thought of doing this event, um, it, it was, it was a, this was back in January, February, um, and, and we said first responders came up as a theme and, and we embraced that. And we thought in terms of uh, the first idea that might come into people's minds of um, maybe it's police, maybe it's firemen, maybe it's doctors, maybe it's um, nurses, uh, uh, maybe it's the EMT, um, you know, when we're hurting. When we, when, but, and, and they got to expand it. Someone said, well, that's, that's one area, but what about, um, um, what does that mean? Maybe how do you become a first responder? And, and, and we added uh, preparing for the journey. So, you know, you can't be a, 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 a responder to anything. You might be a reactor without um, uh, preparation, but to be a, a responder, you need some preparation. So the title became uh, First Responders uh, Preparing for the Journey. Um, so here we are. And um, without any further, um, um, I'm going to bring up the first presenter who's going to be um, our Reverend Jeffrey Brown. A little bit about Reverend Jeffrey Brown. He is associate pastor at 12th Baptist Church. And he works tirelessly in the area of community and social justice. And he travels around the country and, and, and brings his experiences to government and community alike, um, seeking to build partnerships and better relationships. So without, um, here's uh, Reverend Jeffrey Brown. And um, we'll, we'll give him a few minutes to um, bring us um, uh, Tell, talk to us about who they are. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure again to be a part of this wonderful Men's Fellowship Weekend. And um, it's just an honor to be with my fellow presenters. As I'm looking at them really quickly, they are all distinguished. And I think two of them have a tie on. Um, I don't have a tie, but oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner, you, you also have a tie. So, um, but it's, it's just an honor to be here. Uh, uh, Brother Burton has given all of us 10 minutes to, um, to make a presentation, which you know is very difficult for Baptist ministers to do, but we will attempt to try to do those 10 minutes. I'm also just excited to be on a panel uh, with my favorite police commissioner. And uh, as he well knows that when I go around the country working with police departments, I always have to remind them that my city has uh, the best police department and, and, and the best commissioner. It's not just the fact that he's handsome, but he's also very insightful and uh, has been able to command uh, this force through all of these turbulent times. So thank you, thank commissioner. You. Thank you. This, this is thing. why he makes me call him Big Brother Almighty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll slip you $20 later on. Yep. Um, so <laughs> I'm here to talk about who the first responders are. And I can't begin uh, this segment without remembering 
uh, our, celeb uh, our remembrance a few days ago, uh, September 11th, when we had first responders doing uh, the uh, ultimate duty and giving the ultimate sacrifice in New York City. Uh, members of the fire department in New York, members of the police department in New York, uh, and other first responders saving lives. We always talk about the um, three, nearly 3,000 people who were killed uh, in 9-11 in the Twin Towers, but we don't talk enough about the fact that there were at least 25,000 people who were saved uh, you know, as a result of, of people getting them safely out of those buildings. And so we always think about them as first responders. Uh, we think about uh, the medical profession is also being a part of the first responders as we are dealing with this pandemic. And so you have doctors and nurses uh, who have done their level best to try to care for uh, people like ourselves and our families, and they uh, work long hours uh, and um, get very little sleep and go back and do it again all for the sake of making sure that people will be able to live and survive through this pandemic. We also think about government folks who are first responders, uh, who are trying to create the conditions so that this pandemic, for example, will not um, uh, bring an undue burden upon our land. Uh, and although we've been hard pressed in, in many different ways by secluding ourselves, wearing masks, practicing social distancing, uh, we, we have an able governor and a government and an able mayor uh, who has been able to uh, make sure that uh, folks are able to live together in the city of Boston safely. Um, but, you know, there are also other types of first responders. You know, parents are also first responders in the care of their children. But we also want to talk about first responders in a spiritual sense. And I'd like to direct you to the parable of the Good Samaritan. It uh, happens uh, in the uh, 10th chapter of Luke during a time in which uh, Jesus was um, recruiting disciples and sending them out into the land. And when they came back, uh, they exclaimed, you know, even the demons are subject to your name. And Jesus said to them, remember what you see because not everybody is going to be able to see that. Then there was a young ruler who uh, approached Jesus and said, uh, what, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, well, you know the commandments, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. And the uh, lawyer responds by saying, I've done all of this from the youth up. And uh, Jesus looks at him and says, all right, you, you're all right, do this and you will live. And then the lawyers, in order to justify himself, and we're not really sure of the justification, uh, why maybe he was embarrassed by, by asking such a simple question or uh, maybe confused about the second part of that commandment, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. He says to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus responds by, giving that parable uh, of a man who uh, was traveling and uh, on the Jericho Road and is accosted by robbers and beaten nearly to death. And the parable goes that a priest comes by, looks to see what's happening, uh, sees the person on the ground, and then walks the other way. And the second piece was that a rabbi went by and did the same thing as the priest did. But then a Samaritan came by, and for those who were listening to this for the first time, realized the tension there because the Samaritan was um, not uh, of the uh, Southern Kingdom, but uh, from the Northern Kingdom, and uh, there was tensions between Samaritans and Jews. But this Samaritan saw the man, picked him up, bound his wounds, uh, put him on his donkey, took him to a hotel, put him in a room, and told the hotel owner 
uh, put everything on my tab and I'll take care of it when I come back. And that, in my mind, is a first responder. And we all can be first responders like this uh, rich young ruler. And I have a couple things I just want to say really quickly about that. And, uh, and then uh, I guess my time is up. But um, the first thing about that first responder is that first responder moved. And what I mean by that is that he made a move towards the injured person and began to take care of them. First responders are people who will come out of the web of business as usual and get to the situation where there is a need. And when I was doing my work uh, out in the streets of Boston some 30 years ago, there was no template about how to do this. We just went out into the streets, we moved. And in order to be a first responder, you have to see the need and not think about yourself or your situation or business as usual and begin to move. And so, um, you know, moving means coming out of the shell of what I would call business as usual. Uh, you know, I could have stayed, for example, uh, in church, be a good pastor, take care of my family, and then everybody would have considered me successful. Everybody but the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit was the one who moved me to go into the unknown. And that's what first responders do. And then the second thing that they do is that they create. They create a space where things can be possible. And they do that because they are led by the Spirit of God. This man was dying on the side of the road and was really left for dead. But this Samaritan came and created conditions so that this man could live. And for those of us who follow Jesus Christ, we have to be the kind of people that will allow the spirit to help us create spaces where people can live and can, people can survive. There's a lot of stuff that's going on in our world today. Uh, 2020 has become some kind of year to live in, but it really is important for us as Christians as people of God, to be able to jump into spaces that is not business as usual and to create spaces where people can live. And then finally, I would say the last part of that really comes with the responsibility of the work that we do. Uh, there's another parable of the sower and the seed that Brother Burton wanted me uh, to mention. And, you know, we talk about uh, the seeds hitting various types of ground. Our pastor-elect preached about this a couple of weeks ago. What that parable actually means, I'm sorry, my, my timer stopped, so I must be at 10 minutes. But um, what, what that parable means is, is that it's not the responsibility of the seed uh, to do what it can. It's the responsibility of the ground to be responsive. So when God calls you to get into a space that is beyond business as usual, it's up to you. It's your responsibility to respond. You have to be the kind of person that will make the ground fertile so that action can happen so that God can be glorified in the midst of it. And since um, I'm out of time, I really would like to talk more, but I'm out of time. But I hope um, you get an idea of who, at least in our context, a first responders should be. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Brown. That was a very dynamic, um, like a good Baptist preacher, you, you gave us three points. And I'm, I'm hoping that people have their uh, pencils and pens out and they're writing down some of this um, rich nuggets that are gonna be given out this day. So I have a little poll that I'd like to just pop up on the, on the screen right now. It's very short. Um, and if everybody would, that's a panelist or even a, a, a particularly attendees would just make a, a choose an answer. You have about five seconds. 
before we proceed and uh, end the poll. So um, you, have, you see questions there and we'll, and we'll see out of the people that uh, are taking this poll, what the percentage is to the question that's being posed. And the poll is now closed. And um, I'm going to share the results and you can see the results. And that's what we got to the answer of the question of when you hear first responders, you first think of yourself, the group you're in or others. Others wins, that's very good. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing the results, close the poll. All right. Um, the next um, presenter, thank you, Reverend Brown, um, uh, with, is um, Brother Daryl Simpson. Uh, Brother Daryl Simpson is director of 12th Baptist Church after school program. And he works with students and families to support the academic and spiritual enrichment of, of those groups of people. So uh, without too much more for me, anything more, I would like to introduce Daryl. And Daryl, for your presentation, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for tuning in. And I just wanna share some things with you um, on getting prepared. As an educator and a former head college basketball coach, I just wanna share a little bit of my basketball philosophy as it relates to getting prepared and being uh, what you might call a first responder when called into action. So, um, title of this is Chance Favors a Prepared Mind. I would rather be preparing and be ready, to be ready to be called and not prepare and be called and not be able to perform. So starts, um, my on the course philosophies are pretty simple. Um, excellence comes from perseverance of always striving to be better today than you were yesterday. Defense is where we make our living. It takes hustle, intensity, desire, and commitment to play defense the way it needs to be played. Your opponent can't score if they can't retain possession of the ball or if they're always trailing the play. Now, how I look at that from a spiritual sense is, I, I go to James chapter 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Because defense, as I said, it takes commitment, desire, and intensity to play defense the way it needs to be played. But as it relates to a first responder, you have to be committed. You have to have desire. And you have to be ready on call. And Proverbs 16 and 3 also says, commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. So as it relates to your commitment to being a first responder, being ready and being prepared, all you have to do is trust in the Lord and he will see you through that. But if you don't have the qualities of being committed and desire to serve, then being a first responder might not be for you. Now, um, as it relates to my offense, I like an up-tempo game fueled by defense properly played defense will shut down and take and defense played properly will shut down any offense um, and it can create uncontested scoring opportunities for your team as for my defenders I expect you to be able to contain your man on defense but prefer a lockdown ball hard type of defender in either case you'll work hard on defense but you'll also have help from your teammates and on offense although I consider myself to be a system coach we will run on everything in order to gain the advantage over our opponents. And that kind of takes me to Philippians chapter four, verses six, 12, and 13. You know, do not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to Christ. And that's powerful right there, because with him as an ally, and in your corner as a first responder, you definitely have the upper hand. Now, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. And I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether living in plenty or in want. And that looks like, man, um, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking about some things here. And it's just, it's, it's just amazing to be in a position to be um, a first responder and being able to to do what it is that we do. But um, 
I also know that through everything, through Christ Jesus, he gives us strength. Um, but uh, as it relates to what I mentioned about what I like on offense and defense, that's just a fancy wish list. But uh, Philippians speaks of a guarantee because you can do everything through Christ Jesus who gives us strength. Whether we are in need, whether it looks lush, or whether it looks bare, there's nothing that we can't do uh, when, we can, when we commit ourselves to Christ. Now, I prefer an offense with simple and constant movement that has multiple scoring options built into the play. It will wear any defense down and not as a trickery to run plays to create scoring opportunities when the offense stalls when we need to settle down and execute our game plan efficiently. Scorers, you need to be confident in your abilities and efficient. And with that acumen, I expect you to score in bunches. My rebounders, I expect you to box out, uh, have great position and rebound the ball. This will get us extra possessions for our team on the offensive and defensive ends of the court. Our goal is to limit our opponent's, uh, our opponent's possessions to one per trip. And by the games and my expectation is to have a minimum of eight more possessions than our opponent. Now, that makes me think of Ephesians uh, verses, chapter six, verses 13 to 17. And that talks about putting on the full armor of God and preparing yourself to be able to stand firm and to do whatever it takes to achieve some of the things that I talked about in the previous, um, previous set of points. If you're a rebounder, you gotta box out, you gotta be prepared to do that. You have to be ready to stand firm and stand in the gap. Sometimes when it's hard, because nobody likes to play defense, nobody likes to do the dirty work. And that's what the first responders do. They do the work that other people don't wanna do because if it was that easy, everybody would be doing it. So you definitely have to stand firm and hold your ground with that. Um, and Ephesians talks about here the things that are your armor. Stand with the blessed plate of breastplate of righteousness, feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And that's important if you're going to be a first responder. In addition, you need to take up the shield of faith, which will extinguish all the flaming arrows of the enemy. And lastly, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And that should bring you peace in what you're doing when you are that first responder or when you are being called to do something that Christ needs you to do. Now, I speak about practice here. Practice is where you put the work in and learn to perfect your craft. Practice is hard, but the game is where you reap all the benefits. And I like to think about uh, Psalms chapter 144, verse 1. Praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands, who trains my hands and my fingers for, trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. And without being ready and being prepared for battle, we won't be able to do, do we won't be able to do what we're asked to do or we're called on. And I think that takes a special kind of person to step up and be ready to be molded like that. And when you practice as well, I think about James is do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourself, but do what it says. God is going to prepare you for everything that you need to do. All you have to do is be ready. And lastly, um, this is a quote that I give all my players and when I'm coaching. Um, you play as hard as you can and as long as, as long as you can and you do it to the very best of your ability. I will expect nothing less from you because in return, I will give nothing less to you. And what jumps out to me is Romans chapter nine, verses 17. It says, I have raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my I might display my power in you that my name be proclaimed in all the earth. God has a purpose for you. All you have to do is step in to your space and claim that because he will give you everything that you need to succeed and he will do what it takes to make sure that you're prepared to step into the gap and do what you're called to do. So being a first responder is just one of those things where you have to be willing to do 
what you're called to do when you're called to do it, no matter what the situation comes, because you can be used and your gifts won't go, they won't go unnoticed. That's it. Thank you, brother um, Simpson. That was very enlightening. Um, Daryl loves basketball. He always um, uh, talks about the time he spent uh, coaching, and um, it's always very informative. It's and it, it, it really comes to practice. Um, I, I know in his use, um, I'm working with the students, and working with the parents, even in his after school program at 12th after Church. Thank you for your points. Um, I have another little poll here. Um, uh, this one is getting prepared. Um, uh, there, it's uh, a ch make a choice of um, these um, of these um, opportunities. Uh, what do you need to get prepared? Is is, is education, practice, experience? Um, which ones um, uh, beg the most uh, attention? And I know it can be very challenging as far as priorities and 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 um, seasons of that we're in, but. Um, it seems like um, education is um, coming up as, as number one. Um, can't do what you don't know. Um, and I'm gonna end the poll in uh, five, four, three, two, one. Um, and I'm gonna um, um, I'll just share the results. As you probably see education's number one, uh, practice and experience. Um, uh, it's important. You know, it's a constant challenge, even as, as we who have been given much, it, what's expected of us is to share what we know. Jesus did not put us here to just keep everything we know to ourselves. By teaching and sharing and fellowship, we have opportunities to um, educate. Comes in many different ways. Um, so I'm going to um, end this poll. And, all right, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Simpson. Next up on our line is um, is uh, missionary uh, Tony Price. Uh, he is a he's he is a he's a, a brother. He's a Dane minister, a missionary at Twelfth Baptist Church, uh, with a heart for strengthening men. He makes relevant the values and the message of the gospel through relationship building, uh, workshops, and a powerful time out with Tony uh, podcast. Uh, so you'll hear more about that. He does a podcast. He'll tell you about it himself. But but at this point in time, we turn it over to um, to our Brother Price. Thank you, Brother Sidney. I'm going to go right into my presentation. Give me a second here. Let's go. So I know I don't have much time. Um, so I want to go right away into my presentation. You know, I'm honored to be here on the panel with such esteemed guests. I appreciate the invitation to join this esteemed panel this morning. Uh, thank you, Brother Sidney, for that invitation. You know, there are a lot of powerful men in this, on this presentation, on this panel, so I hope that the people are, are, who are watching are really taking down notes because you're going to, as Sidney said, you're going to get a lot of valuable nuggets. And Brother Darrell, I appreciate your presentation, man, and how you use sports as an analogy to getting stronger in the word and being a first responder. So mine's is titled, Hold the Line. Brothers, and I, and I want to go quickly through the information that I have, and I have quite a few slides here, but what I want you to, to envision is that old childhood game that we play when we play tug of war. And you, you, know, you can see yourself, you're on one side of the, of, of the rope, and you, and you have your opponent on the other side, and you're holding that line, you're holding firm, you're holding grasp, your grasp is tight. And we know the object of the game is obviously there's a, there's a, there's a, a flag in the middle or whatever you want to use as a marker. And the, and the goal is to pull and pull to they get that marker to move to your side. And over there, you will claim the victory. So usually in my sessions, I'm a lot more interactive. We have some breakout groups. So I'm going to ask you during this session, since we can't be in person, we're doing virtual, to use the chat room as our interaction. So somebody type in there, claim the victory. Just type of that in the chat room, claim the victory, because that's the object when we hold the line, we want to get to the end and get to the reward, which is holding the line, and that's victory. So I asked God, I said, Jesus, what, what, what would you like me to show the men and women who are logged on today as an example of someone who holds the line? Some of you may recognize this gentleman right away, but for those of you who don't, God pointed me right away to the Apostle Paul as somebody who exemplifies someone who held the lines. 
as you know, the story, and I'm not going to go into depth of it because you can, I encourage you to look up Paul's story yourself, research it. But he's a good example of someone who was holding the line. He, he was a Jew who converted to Christianity after his encounter on the road to Damascus. But what makes him amazing to me is that he constantly encouraged his peers and others to hold the line, to not give in to temptation, not give in to false ideology, not to give in to see to false preachers and teachers. His life mission became preaching the gospel to the Gentiles or the outsiders, if you will. Somebody type in the room, hold the line. When you are holding the line, this is, this is what Paul said, you've got to be willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God has chosen. So when you are holding that line, you have to endure, have perseverance, patience, tenacity at times to keep holding that line. So again, I'm going to ask you, if you're going to be a first responder, are you willing to endure anything to the glory of Christ Jesus? If you are, just type in the chat room, type in the word endure. Now, one of the challenges of being a first responder is this. And it's found in First Peter. It says, Dear friends, don't be surprised about the fiery trials that have come among you to test you. These are not strange happenings. And then you can read the rest there. So when you are a first responder, you are going to be under attack. Don't be surprised. You're going to find yourself in fiery trials. Some of you right now are going through those fiery trials. Some of you may have just come out of fiery trials. And for the rest of you, just hold on. They're on the way. These fiery trials are meant to discourage you, they're meant to derail you, and they're meant to cause you to miss your assignment. Whatever you do, persevere and hold on, and don't be surprised that you're going through those fiery trials. As a first responder, that can make your job tough. This, as a first responder, will tell you, if you know anybody that's a first responder, that are EMTs, police officers, or firefighters, they'll tell you some of the most difficult challenges they face on their job is dealing with people who don't realize they're sick or injured, and oftentimes don't appreciate your efforts when it comes to helping them. So as a first responder, when you encounter people in this category, it can be very discouraging, and it makes your job difficult, and you can even feel underappreciated. And oftentimes, when you begin to help people, your critics will wonder why you're trying to help those people. Who are those people you're trying to help? Why would you waste your efforts and time on those people? And, and that, you saw that story played out in one of the parables in Luke when the, 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 the critics were criticizing Jesus for helping. He, he had just come out of Capernaum. He had, you know, was walking around the road, and he saw a tax collector named Levi, and he asked Levi to come join him, and Levi threw a big feast in his home that evening. And when he did, he had all the tax collectors or people that were considered sinners at the, at the table with Jesus. And the Pharisees would ask his disciples, why is he eating with these scum, the people that are on the fringe of society? Why is he eating with them? And in Jesus' words, he said, the people who are healthy don't need a doctor, but those who are sick are the ones who need a doctor. So when you are on the front line, you got to remember why you were doing what you're doing. Understand that people will criticize you. They will put that, will understand why you're doing what you're doing. And also you will get discouraged. But remember, those people are the people that God has sent you to help. When you are on the front lines of the first responder, brother, and you come through the trials, you have a decision to make. You can do it your way or you can do it God's way. And God tells us very clearly in Luke, you can see I was reading Luke this morning, that in Luke 6, 48 and 49, that if a man does it God's way, he's like a man who builds a house on a solid foundation. And when the storms of life come against him and those fiery trials come, as, come against you and attack you, you will be able to weather the storm because you're built on a strong foundation. Conversely, when you decide to do it your way, God also, Jesus also says in that same scripture, that you're like a man who builds a house on a shaky foundation. And when the storms of life come against you, you will fold and you will collapse. So when you, as a first responder, when you're going under trials, you're under duress and you're, you know, you're trying to figure out what's the best way to do this, ask yourself, am I doing it my way 
or God's way. If you're in the chat room, type God's way. We're also encouraged to just hold on a little bit longer. Help is on the way. We know that when we are struggling as first responders, we're going through things, God is there. Jesus said he is our comforter. We're going to go through some tough times. And often when we go through tough times, we hear that scripture quoted, most often quoted scripture is Psalm, is Psalm 30 and five, right? It says, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, I, I wish I could give this pastor credit. I was watching a pastor one day, he gave me a great revelation on that. When you read that scripture, we usually go right to the, but joy comes in the morning, we get excited. And that's the reason to get excited. There's a promise attached to that. But we skip through one particular part. The scripture says, weeping may. The word may is a modal verb, which means it's a suggestion, it's a possibility, it's a likelihood that it could happen, but it is not a guarantee that weeping will endure for the night. So when you're going through those tough times, don't settle with the fact that you have to live with that and think it's going to last forever. Then you see the word but, and anytime after you see the word but, there's almost something you can bank on. It's a guarantee, it's a promise. Joy comes in the morning. That's what we get excited about, right? Jesus confirmed this again in Luke 6, 21. He says, blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. That's something for you to get excited for. So again, when you're going through those trials, you're ready to give up, ready to let the rope go, just hold on a little longer because help is on the way. Lastly, brothers, we know the value of training, right? We train our physical bodies. We know that this value is healthy, makes us stronger. We understand that part. But when you are a first responder, not only are you training physically, you've got to train mentally to be prepared for what life is going to throw at you. All of the vicissitudes of life, you've got to be ready. We know that there's, when, when a lot of those first responders go through their basic training or through the academy, they're being taught, they're being instilled things that are going to be what we consider discipline so that they have repetition after repetition so that they will know how to act while they are out in the field when they face those challenges. So it's important for us as first responders to make sure we are also getting training. And I'm, gonna, I'm down to my last two slides, so just hang on with me, brothers. I'm going through as quickly as possible. The value of training is important, okay? I'm gonna give you three steps right now. I'll leave you with these three steps that will help you prepare. Consider me your instructor at the academy, your drill sergeant, if you will, that are going to help you as you learn and continue to hold the line. Let's go. Here they are. There are three daily exercises you can do that will help you in holding that line. The first one is vocal praise. Tell the Lord to love him. Just offer thanksgiving for the blessings that have come to mind. For those of you who are awake this morning, you are on this call, that's reason enough to praise him. I like what the gospel artist Brent Jones says, open your mouth and say something. Vocal praise is one how you can start your day. The second part is to read scripture and meditate on the word. I would encourage you to try to read a chapter a day, then think about what you've read and how it applies to you. And before you read the scripture, you can even do a simple prayer, like pray before you begin, Lord, please open your word to me today and watch how the scripture comes off the page into your spirit. And then last but certainly not least, devote a time for prayer. Maybe first thing in the morning, maybe your lunch break, maybe while you're driving in your automobile, whatever you can do, just devote a small time for prayer. These are three practical steps that will help strengthen you if you do them daily as you hold that line. And lastly, if you need another reason for why you should hold the line, brothers, here it is. Your family, future generations, they're all looking for us as men of God and as men to be strong and hold that line so that we can pass the rope on to them. They're going to learn how to hold that line based upon how we react in our cues. They're counting on us. As I close, brothers, we know that, you know, their first responders are oftentimes, we can easily identify them. Some of them are in uniforms. We can see them right clearly. But then there are those of us who are playing clothes who are also first responders. And we got to understand that we both have value. And that just remember, whatever you do, as you go through the trials, brothers, hold that line. Health is on the way. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brother Price. Um, priceless. Uh, 
I love that man. Uh, he's one of the brothers that is in my uh, uh, inner circle. He just senses when uh, I need some encouragement. He calls me up and he, he challenges me. You know, that, that, that word accountability is so important. And um, um, I, he holds me accountable. Did you do this? Did you do that? Let me pray for you. You know, uh, we, we, and, and part of that has to do a lot with transparency. You know, we're real with each other. We give each other the right to speak into each other's lives. And that's so important. Uh, that, that's one thing that God has, 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 has revealed to me. You, you, you're not uh, in this by yourself. You got me, first of all, and I got you. So, so it, it, we fellowship, we expand. And this is such a great thing that we have to, to give this out to other people. Thank you. Uh, Brother Price. I hope y'all got that. You, you can imagine what it's like to um, have him doing a workshop with you. Um, I, I, uh, he didn't tell you a little bit more about his um, his um, uh, Time Out with Tony podcast. We're going to post these resources on the Men's Fellowship page later, and those of you who did register for these, this uh, 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 webinar will be able to see this again, and, and we'll make it so it makes sure that it goes further than it's going today. Uh, so I got a poll. Um, this is a short one. Um, the question is, hold, um, um, holding the line um, in progress. It says, um, attendees, uh, see, holding which, one, holding which of these lines is most important? If you could only pick one, uh, which one would you pick? Uh, would it be believing God, protecting family, or whatever I want? And yes, I'm doing this um, um, anonymously, so in case you choose something that's uh, you don't have to agree with everybody. You might have be in a different place. So I'm ending the poll. 100% of the people said believe in God. Um, um, I didn't add obeying God. It's another another point. Blessed is he who's not just a hearer of my word, but a doer. Um, it comes to my mind. Um, thank you, Brother uh, Price. So um, next up, we have um, uh, be, uh, the topic of being on the front with uh, our uh, Pastor Willie Bodrick, a little bit about um, Pastor Bodrick. He's the f uh, 14th elected pastor of 12th Baptist Church, who will begin his tenure on January of um, 2021. Um, um, he's a native of Atlanta, Georgia, who came to Boston to complete his degree in divinity at Harvard University. And uh, now with a doctor's degree and near receiving his law uh, degree. Um, um, uh, Pastor um, uh, Willie is a gifted speaker, uh, active in the community, new husband um, to wife Devin, and a new father. So I just want to um, give this over to um, Reverend Bodrick, and um, at this time, I will mute myself. Welcome, Reverend Bodrick. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Brother Burden, and I uh, just want to let you know you're doing an amazing job, so you can you can ease up with your with your nervousness. You're doing a great job. Uh, thank you to you, brothers. Uh, this has been an exciting and fruitful morning already, and just hearing each and every one of you, from Reverend Brown to Brother Brother Darrell, then Brother Tony, Missionary Tony, and you know, it's been a very encouraging, thematic push towards us being both first responders and having very pragmatic approaches to how we should really view ourselves and think about ourselves. I'm so excited to see uh, the other big Willie in the, in the room here. Uh, I love Commissioner Gross who's here with us and we're thankful for our friendship and relationship and the work that you do for our city each and every day and to be in fellowship with us here at 12 Baptist Church. And I always wanna shout out my pastor, the Reverend Dr. Arthur T. Gerald, who's the smoothest guy on this, on this line. Uh, brothers, uh, we're, we're very grateful. And, um, and I thought it was very apropos that we find ourselves under the theme first responders. Uh, as Brother Burton mentioned earlier, I don't think we could have ever predicted that this theme would have so much resonance in this particular time. Uh, you've heard how we've identified it. And we're living in a moment where we have been pushed to reorient how we think about and understand what is important and how we've captured who is important. Um, we're living in a moment that has forced many of us to see the values and the value of those who we've now labeled essential workers. 
And they've given us a picture of what it really means to be on the front lines. As many of us know, when you think about the front lines, you think about those who are going off to battle, those who are on the very first regiment, who are taking on the attack and having to stand out in front. When you think about the front lines, I think about football and how we're back in football season and being in, in that line and being on the front, front interaction of contact. Um, but now we, we don't think about just those battles. We think about global pandemics. Uh, we think about police and pastors who are out there doing the work, firemen and deacons, deaconesses and churches coming together. You, you think about the AV ministry now being the front lines of interaction for communities of faith. You think about not only just our doctors, but those who are picking up our trash, those who are working in our grocery stores, those who are doing the everyday necessities to engage us at this very difficult time. And yet, we saw a different front line. Those who were trying to fight and speak up against racial injustice and speak out against state action violence against people. And, and as Isaiah pushes us to think yeah, that we, as people on the front lines, we must learn to do what is right and seek justice what does that look like? That looks like defending the oppressed. That looks like taking up the cause of those who are vulnerable and pleading for those who are in need. It's a calling, but if there's something in this particular moment that this pandemic, that this season of unjust friction has taught me is that life will sometimes force you onto the front lines where you will have to fight and stand on your faith to get through. Have you been there, brothers? Where it wasn't your choice, but life positioned you there? Have you been there? Situations, circumstances arise where you didn't see it coming, it came out of nowhere, but somehow, some way, you're having to face this issue and you're now on the front lines of a battle in your own life. Maybe it's personal, maybe it's family, maybe it's been on your job, maybe it's been in the communities, but each and every one of us have come to this moment where life has forced us to the front lines. We didn't ask for it, but we got drafted into this experience. And now we've come to realize that you need to have certain things to help you be on that front line. And I think Paul opens our eyes, which is why I was so happy to hear Brother Tony open with that Pauline framework, because Paul opens our eyes in 1 Corinthians when he says these words, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And I believe that is where I like to settle for this particular time as we think about the front lines, because I believe that Paul gives us a subscription of how we are to execute when we're on the front line. Now, recognize this, Paul was dealing with a difficult situation. He starts these church plant churches in Corinth as he's before he's going to Ephesus. And Paul is trying to reform and reshape this church, these household churches that have found themselves in a very divisive place. The folks were factioning off. They were struggling with one another. And I think we in our society have dealt with the most divisive moments that I've seen in my lifetime. And Paul is trying to bring healing clarity and more importantly, how they are to see Jesus Christ theologically and live out the gospel each and every day. And I believe Paul brings us to this moment where he's trying to help them understand if you're going to get to where God is calling you as men and women to be, if you're going to get to where God needs you to be, then you've got to understand how to, one, hold fast on the line. And not only just hold fast, but be on the front line. And I think that brings me to the first thing I want to encourage you, my brothers, is that the first thing you need on the front lines is that you need to learn how to be steadfast. 
Paul says, my brothers, I need you to stand firm. What does it mean to stand firm? I thought about it. Standing is a position that is in juxtaposition, juxtaposition to sitting, which means you are standing erect. That means that you're maintaining an upright position in the face of opposition. Stand firm, suggesting that in the face of struggle, strife, and difficulty, we still maintain an upright position. And men of God, if we're going to be on the front lines of our communities, of our families, if we're going to execute and do the things that we've called ourselves to do in this particular season as 12th Baptist Church, we've got to learn how to stand firm. Firm, maintain that upright position. What does it mean? It means being able to have a solid stand against an unyielding situation. That means that you can stand firm. I think the psalmist had it right when he said, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus's blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus name on Christ. Watch this, the solid rock I stand. We have to stand firm on Jesus Christ because all other ground is sinking sand. Paul calls us to stand firm, but standing firm is not just standing physically. But may I suggest to you that standing firm is also standing with a resolute determination and also a strength of character. See, as men, we can't just stand firm in a physical sense because eventually these bodies do break down. But what stands beyond our physicality is our character and our determination in Jesus Christ. Who are you? What stands up when you're in difficult situations? What holds you erect when you're in tough circumstances? Paul calls them to stand firm and literally so the first thing that you got to do on the front lines if you're not going to get pushed back is that you got to be steadfast the next thing paul encourages us is not only are we to stand firm but watch this you got to learn this ability to be stationary what does that mean that means that whatever is coming up against you you can't be moved i like this because reverend brown talked about being on the move I was encouraged about that, how he has to, we have to go out and be on the move because first responders are on the move. But when you're on the front lines, at some point, you got to hold your ground. You got to be unmovable. You got to be unpushed and you got to be able to stand firm. What holds us like this? I think we come from a people who've always understood what it means to dig our heels in the ground and hold our ground and not allow for the things that are coming up against us to move us. That's why the old saint said that I shall not be moved because I'm like a tree planted by the waters. How do you plant yourself in your particular place? I think the way in which we do that and the way in which we plant ourselves is that we dig deeper into what God is calling us to do. Brother Tony just gave us, we've got to pray, we've got to read, we've got to adhere, but watch this, we also have to be able to come together and be able to lock arms as men of God so that we cannot be movable. I think one of the hardest things for to get brothers in the church and men of the hardest things to sustain men in the church is because many of us are trying to do this Christian walk alone. And you can't do this work all by yourself. You know how I'm unmovable? When I can hold on to a brother. And if I'm not moved, he's not moved. I imagine being out there on the football field and we used to do kickoff team and we, we do this kickoff return team, this formation where we would come back and we would lock arms and create a wall so that the, uh, the return man could, could actually build off of us. And the hope was that whatever was coming against us from that kickoff team would not move us or break us because if we held together, we would get to our goal, which was to score. And may I suggest the Christian tradition and faith should be the same, that we should learn how to lock arms because when we come together, there is strength in numbers. 
So he tells us not only we got to be steadfast, not only we have to be learn how to be stationary, but watch this. We've got to be able to be sold out. One of the hardest parts about this Christian, uh, Christian journey is that sometimes we lack the commitment as well as the resolute nature within us to totally give ourselves to the task at hand. Watch what Paul says. Paul says this, always give yourself fully, not partially, not a little bit, not every other week, but fully to the work of the Lord. Because what we know is that the work we do for God is never in vain. And may I encourage you that you've got to continue to give yourself fully to the work of God. The reason why some of us have struggles in our walks is because we have one foot in and one foot out. We come every once in a while we read every once in a while, or we're selective about how we engage our faith. Many a times, as I think about it, the things that push us to faith are hard times. There are folk who just started praying for real when we got in this pandemic. There are people who really started opening their Bibles once we got in the midst of this strife. But what I'm suggesting to you, when you fully give yourself to the work of the Lord, you know that even when there seemingly are trials, you know that there is still victory that is to come. And the work that you're doing does not always seem like it's yielding results, but God is letting us know that nothing we do for him is in vain. And so though we may have just 30 brothers on the line, 30, 30 people on the line, the work is still happening and manifesting and everything that we're doing right now, God is honoring it if we totally give ourselves to him. And that means we have to yield ourselves in submission to faith. That means trusting God when it doesn't seem like there's a way out. That means continuing to sow those seeds when it seems like it's not producing. That means continuing to speak up for justice in the midst of opposition. That means standing up for your families and standing up for those brothers and sisters who are in need. That means we've got to be on the front lines. And if we do that, we can protect those who God has called us to protect. And we can change our communities. And we can show people that there is a God who's able to do all things in all circumstances. And so we're going to be on the front lines, brothers. You've got to be sold out. You've got to be stationary. And more importantly, you got to be able to stand firm and stand firm in Jesus Christ, our Lord. God bless you all. Thank you, um, Pastor Bodrick. Um, um, maybe I could use this recording for tomorrow's service if you can't make it. <laughs> but uh, uh, words of wisdom, um, and there's no doubt in my mind why, why this brother has been elected the 14th pastor of 12 Baptist Church. I mean, 12 Baptist Church is a, came off of um, Boston's um, Beacon Hill. It's one of the oldest uh, uh, organized black churches in the country. And we've been in existence for over 220 years. It's, it's, it's um, as, as part of a group of churches that came out of that first church. But um, praise, praise God that, that this, this con continues. And as I'm constantly hearing, we can't just be comfortable with what we've done. Um, we, we, we can't rely on and fall back on our, our legacy and our history. We got to go forward because uh, the battle is continually uh, going on. And uh, for such a time as this is why we are here. I got a poll. Uh, I'm going to launch it now. Um, and um, it's... Um, not amazing that uh, these questions are, are relevant. So take your five seconds, 10 seconds, uh, choose one um, to um, answer this question. 
when all is on the line, what happens? Five, four, three, two, one. Um, I'll end the poll and I will share the results. Um, it comes up that uh, when, when all is on the line, um, you stand your ground. A uh, very controversial topic, but I wonder why, because um, that's what we must do. Just make sure you're on the right side. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's the Lord's side and, and you'd be all right. Um, all right, uh, so we'll make that go away. Thank you, um, uh, Pastor Bodrick. Um, it's, 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 it's great. Um, so next up, um, I, I, before I go any further, I just want to say uh, there's a person who, who's not on the panel, but he's on the panel, Anthony Query, and we just want to give a, a recognition to him. He's, he's, as I said earlier, he's a, definitely he's doing a great job just even being there. He's, 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 he's been very supportive to me, doing a lot of graphics, doing a lot of, um, of technology, and um, you know that's what we need is young folks that see the vision, that are committed to the commitment, and, and he's here. And I just, uh, we're gonna hear from him in the, in the future. So, so, so be prepared for that. Um, thank you, Anthony. Um, next um, coming up, we have um, Dr. Joshua Bartholomew. Um, um, he's, he, I like to call him the new kid on the block, but he's, he's, he, he's um, uh, out of college, uh, got an earned doctor's degree on um, religion and uh, theological studies. That's, that's, that's too heavy for me. Uh, I'm just a country boy. Um, um, and, uh, and he has a concentration on social justice. Uh, that's um, very relevant at this time. So he's gonna uh, delve a little bit into the line of it, uh, into the topic of advancing the line. So um, um, Dr. Bartholomew, um, uh, your turn. Uh, thank you, Brother Burton, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it really is an honor to be on this panel with my esteemed colleagues, uh, my pastor, my pastor-elect, uh, Reverend Brown, uh, Missionary Price, Brother Simpson, uh, Anthony, and, uh, and our commissioner. God, God bless you all. Um, I'm really uh, excited to give this presentation, and I've learned so much from each and every one of you, uh, not just today, but in uh, just the time that I have known all of you. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'll be talking about advancing the line. Um, when we think of advancing the line as first, faithful first responders, uh, we think of pressing forward in ministry. Uh, we include uh, common examples such as teaching, uh, preaching, and evangelism, because the life and ministry of Jesus is our model for actions. Um, Mark uh, captures this aspect of discipleship in Mark chapter 3, verse 14, where we see Jesus appointing the 12 apostles. Uh, that they may be with Jesus and that Jesus may send them out to preach. But I want to emphasize verse 15, where it says Jesus appointed his followers to have authority to drive out demons. In order to know what it means to advance the line as first responders of faith, we have to first understand what it means to have the authority to drive out demons. The gospel is a story about spiritual warfare. Verse 15 is a statement that isn't found in every gospel. It's left out in Luke, for example. But Mark's gospel is special because Mark constructed Jesus's first biography. Mark's gospel laid the narrative foundation for Christianity. Before Mark, there was no such story of the life of Jesus. The plot of Mark's gospel is the standard for our Christian imagination. And this is important because the story of Jesus in Mark's gospel is one where God knows Jesus, and so do spirits and demons. But people, not even those closest to him, don't seem to know Jesus. By framing the story of Jesus in this way, Mark is showing us that the substance of a life in Christ is a fight against evil in this world. And this fight begins with being able to discern the battlefield. 
to be effective at pressing forward in ministry, Christians must first know how to discern what the Spirit of Christ is doing in the world. In the active will of God, it invites us to participate in the way of Jesus. But if we can't first recognize what the Holy Spirit is doing in the world, then we won't fully understand why we preach, teach, and evangelize. We proclaim the word of God because faith in God gives us the authority to push back against demonic spirits and evil in the world. The great example of what this looks like is Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 13. In this story, Jesus encountered a man possessed by an evil spirit. And when Jesus asked the demon its name, it said legion, which in Jesus's language means many, as in many demons. However, given that Rome had complete military domination of the known world, I would argue that Mark also expected readers to associate the name legion with the Roman military formation of about 6,000 soldiers. And so as Ephesians 6.12 says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities in high places. Therefore, this story of Jesus healing someone from demonic possession serves as a metaphor for the way the faithful are called to drive out evil powers and principalities like racism, economic inequality, sex, sexism and gender injustice, and so on. To have the authority to drive out demons means to apply your faith in the struggle for social justice. Mark is saying that the struggle for liberation isn't just consistent with the gospel, it is the gospel. In order to advance the line, the church must first discern its place in the struggle for social justice. History has shown us that there hasn't ever been radical social change in the world outside of social movements. Historically, the black church is known for its involvement during the civil rights movement. But there came a time where nonviolent tactics from civil rights leaders became ineffective. And after the US government made racial segregation illegal, it became increasingly difficult to pinpoint racism. The black power movement essentially picked up where black churches left off. The most revolutionary group of activists during the black power movement was the Black Panther Party. As the vanguard of black communities struggle for liberation, the Panthers advanced the line as first responders in prolific ways. While we probably remember the party most for wearing black leather jackets, uh, carrying guns and advocating programs of self-defense, they were most notably proponents of black economic self-determination. Their social programs fought against discriminatory labor practices, police brutality, poverty, and other issues related to anti-black racism. They advanced the line by doing for black communities what we needed to do for ourselves in order to secure our basic liberties and freedoms as human beings. Their programs included free breakfast for children, liberation schools, free housing cooperatives, and much more. And most importantly, they were owned and controlled by their members. The Black Power Movement was the precursor to our current moment of protests and social change. In order for Black Christians to remain re relevant witnesses at the front line of this battlefield, we have to reconcile Christianity with the spirit of the Black Power Movement. And in many ways, Jesus embodied much of the spirituality of the Black Panther Party. There was nothing that Jesus did that the Black Panther Party didn't do. Christ's militant ministry of exercising evil spirits is drawn upon the sacred, the sacred work of expelling forces of sexism, classism, racism, and economic injustice. Our theology, Black theology, asserts that God is for the oppressed and that God is for Black people and against white racism. Early in his career, the most notable a progenitor of black theology, Dr. James Cone, tried very hard to bring together the activist arm of black churches and leaders of the black power movement. But he lamented the fact that black church folks and activists like the Panthers really never got on the same page regarding their tactics in the fight for, li for black liberation. Because there were more black people in prisons today than in 1860, we can still be enriched by the memory of the Panthers as it resonates with our Christian authority to drive out demons. There are three ways the memory of the Panthers can help us advance the line and press forward in ministry. One, 
seeing racial justice as inseparable from economic justice. Jesus was concerned with ending poverty, and so should we. As the largest and oldest economic institution in Black communities, Black churches have a duty as first responders to fight for a world where Black self-determination isn't hindered by poverty and the greed of the wealthy. Two, in the silent aftermath of justice movements of the 1960s that culminated in the Panthers' historic rise, another generation of activists emerged to challenge racism and social in injustice, dec decrying Black Lives Matter. Given that Black churches represent the oldest and largest Black-owned economic institutions in our communities, Black churches and BLM can work together to establish concrete economic aims that would benefit Black people. And three, the last thing we can do to advance the line is center and uplift uh, Black women. The stereotypical profile of the Panther was a Black man, but most of the rank and file membership were Black women. As Black men, it's important that we acknowledge and support the many contributions of women in our ministry. The first people Jesus told to go forth and preach the gospel were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Women were the first evangelists. More importantly, as women is say, in the fight for social justice, if black women get free, then we all get free. It's important that we prioritize the liberation of women as a tactic for all of us to get free. Now, I know uh, 12 is already pressing forward in many of these ways. But imagine if every church, especially every black church, believed in the collective liberation of our people and was unified and grounded in these ethical practices for marginalized communities. As we also reflect on uh, empowering others and making disciples as part of what it means to advance the line, let's always remember that we do so to make real the beloved community for our young people. It's important that we teach our young people that their belonging to Christ is both an internal and social reality. In HYPE, uh, which stands for Helping Young People Excel, a program that we have here at the 12th Baptist Church, I teach our young people to read the Bible and to see Christianity as a socio-cultural movement. It's necessary for them to know that the present social order is not God's way, and the world is organized through a life in Christ. As a church, our responsibility is to mobilize love as the unconditional determination to bring social justice. And that's the essence of the gospel. When we teach our young people that the love of Jesus can be applied in our mission toward challenging social justice, then we are truly living the gospel and advancing the line as the church. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, uh, Brother Bartholomew. That, that was deep. I mean, if I say so myself, and you, you did an excellent job uh, you know, what, when it comes to dealing with some of these issues, um, some people think it's too radical. Some people think it isn't radical enough. Uh, but but um, as, as being prepared for any journey, we need to explore all of this history, all of this information, all of this knowledge. We, we can't stand, we can't hold a line, we can't advance any cause if we don't know what we believe or what, what we believe in. Um, so that's important. Thank you, um, uh, Brother Joshua. Um, I'm going to launch another poll. Um, this poll is, um, when you have to move forward, when you have to move forward, what do you do? Uh, so um, you have 10 seconds, um, two choices. Do you do it alone or do you do it as a group? Um, a very um, challenging question. Um, they just, there is a time and a place for everything. I'm ending the poll and um, the, the consensus is is that um, we do it as a group. Um, you know, even as, as, as Dr. Bartholomew was saying, you know, social action requires working together and the church needs to work. We need unification if, you know, I, I'm not gonna get started, but the church needs to come together. It's hard to um, not preach what you don't practice. And, and, and we need to do these things. Um, the church should be, uh, the most powerful institution in, in, in any community. Um, the black church, because it's a large amount of, of, of first responders and, and essential workers should be the most powerful uh, lobbyist cause. It should be the most powerful social institution. Uh, this is definitely um, true. Um, thank you for a, a little bit of that on advancing the line. Um, 
now, without further ado, uh, we have with us a special uh, guest. Um, uh, William uh, Gross is the police commissioner of uh, Boston, Massachusetts. He just happens to be the first black man in that role. Uh, he's a strong advocate and believer in, in, in social and community policing. And, and he is a member of Morning Star Baptist Church. So without any further ado, uh, see, we're bringing people together here. Uh, we're going to introduce um, uh, Brother um, uh, Goss. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. I I'm going to tell you right now, um, I've, I've learned a lot on this Zoom call. I really have. Even um, from my brother I grew up with on Esmond Street and how to pray, because Lord knows we need it now. Um, thank you for this opportunity, 12th Baptist. Thank you, Reverend Gerald, for paving the way for us brothers. And um, I go back, way back with um, Reverend Brown. I love Willie Bodrick. I teach people how to say his name correctly. And um, all of you, Mr. Simpson, the doctor, thank you for the opportunity for even sharing the stage. And you're all a tough act to follow. But one thing you do as men of the cloth is that you do inspire. You do inspire those who um, are in difficult roles like first responders. Um, and first responders doesn't just mean police, fire, and EMS. First responders to me as a commissioner means the community and thus my strong, strong beliefs in community policing because it really does take a village. Um, and with that being said, that's an African proverb. And as people like to say in old African proverbs. So what does first responders mean to me? It's definitely the village. It's definitely looking out for each other. It's definitely knowing your history. So I'm gonna switch right over a little. What does first responder mean to me as a black commissioner and a man that's been in law enforcement since he was 18 and a half, since 1983, um, that the community raised so I could be in this capacity as the 42nd police commissioner, who is African-American, proud of it. You have to know in law enforcement today, you have to know your history. If you don't know your history, you will be destined to fail. And people often ask me, what does that mean, commissioner? I says, look at the times we're in, in the 21st century. You have to, hold your ground and let people know about the history of the BPD, how the executive branch of the United States, the police officers, as well as the judicial system, and I'll pick a time frame, in the 50s, when you still had Jim Crow era laws and justices, people were dying at the hand of the police in the judicial system and the penal system more so than ever right here right now in the middle of a pandemic and civil unrest you have to be as a first responder you have to be a historian and you have to tell it like it is you can't hide you can't butter it up that didn't happen on my watch that happened before a first responder um responsibility for me is guess what i own everything negative from the bpd and when, you know, our mothers of the church say, not you, baby, what you talking about? I'm like, well, now I'm the face of the department. I do have to acknowledge everything that was wrong, but as well as first responders, you have to learn from mistakes. You have to learn from the past. We use those as teachable learning moments, and then you move forward. And as well, if you can't do that, you will have no legitimacy with the rest of the village that can stand first responders. That's an important, important role of first responders is to know your history. You know your history, you talk about your history, both good and bad, and then people will know your self-worth. Oftentimes, as you said, I'm going to inject, hold the line. I've held the line many times when people ask me about Black Lives Matter, and I give the exact example that I, example that I did if people were still dying at the hands of the criminal justice system as they did decades ago, and those grandmothers and grandfathers 
of today were the young men and women back then. And they're still seeing the same thing now as says people will scream and cry, Black Lives Matter. Because if you don't, then you're gonna think that this is just gonna continue and continue. Do you know how hard it is to give that definition as a law enforcement entity? But you have to hold your line and you tell the truth. And quite frankly, um, yeah, you get heat for it, you know, that fiery trial, but that's okay. You are men of the cloth. You know you have to withstand those fires if you want to progress forward. So know your history. Know your self-worth. Share your history so people realize that we're all worthy together. And then and only then can you move forward with legitimacy in your conversations. But it's not easy. It's not easy telling lessons. It's not easy teaching lessons when you have people, like we said, I listen to y'all, when you have people that have been downtrodden, they've been stepped on, um, they feel left out, um, and you have to be the ones to hold the line, be patient, and teach, teach, teach. But as well, as you're going along, you must, must let those very people educate you too. You must learn from first responders. It's just so important that we realize that each and every one of us are more alike than different. And that when you are a first responder, you also have to um, master the art of communication, master the art of being in a state of empathy, sympathy, care, and respect. Because as first responders, like you said, when, when, when it's tough out there, people are gonna look up to you. They're gonna call you. They're gonna call 911. They're gonna call their reverend. They're gonna call their deacons. Because there's trouble brewing or they're in trouble and they need someone that can help them take care of that problem and overcome the difficulties that, these, that they're facing. So again, um, as a first responder, it's so difficult because a lot of times, as the brother put the sign up, there's God's way. And I like to say, there's the easy way. I'm gonna tell you right now, a lot of times people don't like God's way because you're telling the truth. Just like when you go out and minister, if you go and knock on doors and say, I wanna teach you God's word, how many people won't even come to the door, won't even open the door? But you know you're doing the right thing. But that's the importance of being a first responder as well holding that line, standing firm, and again, um, you have to survive those fiery trials because if you go down, what if all the churches went down? Then that means evil is winning. What if the black churches went down and never had a voice for the community? Since the end of the Civil War, the black churches have been there and they are still here now being the advocates and soldiers and warriors for the people, and I like to say all the people. We don't, we don't revert to the ways of those who have oppressed us, but we teach them what it means to go forward. And as you all say, and I'm still working on it, and utilize the power of forgiveness, and then teach people that we are all human and we are all God's children. As first responders, you have to wear many, many, many different hats. As you all know, you have to be a family member, right? Mother, father, sister, brother, uncle. You also have to wear the hats of, again, educators. You have to wear the hats of being a social worker. You have to wear the hats of being a good listener. And last but not least, you have to wear the hats of being a good student as well. And one thing that I'm really encouraged by is that people have really started to understand what the definition of a first responder is, and that it's not just police or fire or EMS, it is we as the village. And the more first responders we have, the more ambassadors of God we have, the more that the word is spread, and 
each person in that village knows someone that they can talk to and people that look up to them. So if, if Reverend Boderick is teaching me something and this person doesn't get it, as first responders, we have to transfer the lesson so that we can lift up. Don't reach down from, in pity ever, reach out and lift up. That is another hat of the first responder. Reach out and lift up. Let's talk about social justice. As a first responder, you have to have those tough com communications with people who are yelling at you, screaming at you. And, you know, I, I condemn those who murdered Mr. Floyd, but even in that condemnation, people won't like you sometimes just because you're a first responder. People won't like you sometimes because you're a reverend, because to them, it makes them feel uncomfortable. So when you're, you as a first responder are discussing social justice, be willing to have that conversation to make people comfortable. And know this, please be able to have some empathy. Again, I'll go to Black Lives Matter when people are like, oh, Black Lives Matter, they're all militant. I'm like, the question should be, why do you even need to have an, an organization called Black Lives Matter? What happened to make people feel as though that they have to scream and shout and title an organization Black Lives Matter? So again, when you're having these discussions, you have to have empathy. In the murder of Mr. Floyd, it took eight minutes and 46 seconds. I'm always out on the line saying this. You don't know your local police officers. And you feel as though they don't know you. Um, let's not let his death be in vain. If there's eight minutes and 46 seconds, let's take four minutes, split it in half, 23 seconds. You listen to me, I listen to you sincerely. And then let's move forward and work together to improve who we are, where we are, and improve where we are at this point in history and improve ourselves so that we can move forward and bring up our future leaders. It's pretty tough to follow you all because I was quite moved by your words um, and your PowerPoint presentations. I'm kind of emotional now because often as first responders, you feel alone. You feel is that nobody has your back. No one picks up a phone to call you. They'll see something that looks a certain way. They'll hear you say something. Um, you're all alone. And I've watched many people of the cloth go through the same thing, that when you have to hold the line, you're gonna be criticized. But what I learned here today that I need to strengthen as well is that you're not alone. Like my brother, Tony Price said, you're not alone. And that poll was great. When you're gonna do something, do you do it by yourself or as a group? Here's what's one, one thing that's great about the black community, they'll let you know. And the black churches, they'll let you know that you can overcome your mistakes. We as a people have to move forward. All of the kingdoms on earth started in Africa. So again, the importance of teaching people know your history, know your self-worth, and the importance of knowing that in this struggle between good and evil, when you're going forward, not gonna be easy, but it's not gonna be alone. So I'll try to close it out. I don't know how much time I spent, but again, know your history, know your self-worth. Be able to explain who you are and what you're doing now in your role as a first responder. So you have to have transparency. You have to educate, or people are not gonna know that you're different from the 50s and 60s. They're gonna think it's, you're all the same. So you have to be able to break those negative stereotypical images and views. And also, when I talk about educating, you also have to educate the communities that they are, are as well making a difference. We all know about the stereotypical view that black and brown communities often adhere to stop snitching. We're not gonna help the police. So when we advance 
as first responders, we have to let the people know that we're helping, that they're advancing too. Um, there's been 43 homicides this year. I'm going to tell you, everyone that I responded to, I thank the people for calling 911 to show them that, yes, you make a difference. Educate people as first responders. Teach them their worth. You're not desensitized to violence. You're not pieces of crap. You do care. There are black and brown fathers out there. There are mothers. Let people know that those negative stereotypical views that first responders, specifically in law enforcement, have of them is not ringing true anymore. Not here in Boston, it's not. Because people have helped us solve homicides. People have helped us to realize that if you don't bring hope to families that feel like they're isolated and abandoned, then they will go and do anything by any means necessary to make their family survive. So as first responders, again, let people know their self-worth. You have to educate them by, about what's available to them and that, again, you're not alone. Um, then and only then can you move forward. I'm just so inspired today. R Reverend Bodrick was so inspired that the camera was shaking. Um, I just want you all to know that each and every one of you just taught me something. Being a good coach, being a good doctor, that even someone you've known since Esmond Street days can teach you how to pray. And that, yes, young reverends can bring things to light too. And above all, let's not forget who paved their way, Reverend Gerald and Reverend Brown. That's another thing about first responders. Recognize the people that paved the way. Listen to them, they will provide the wisdom so that when you stumble, when you fall, their very lessons will pick you up and keep you moving forward in that march. Let's all be first responders. That's what's missing these days. And in closing, I commend you all as first responders because you're doing something that's tough. You are going forward with the power of God and the word of God. How popular is that these days when you can't have prayer in school? How popular is this these days when at a homicide scene, I say, God bless the person that died and you get criticized for it. How popular is that when you can have people that are saying horrible things in rap songs, sexual acts, money, N-word, this and that by all rappers of all color. But if you say, God bless you, then there's a problem. You violated my rights. As first responders, hold your ground, my brothers and sisters who are out there listening. I always tell people, if you want me to stop saying, God bless you, or mentioning Jesus Christ, you can have the gun and you can have the badge. Because what we have to remember as first responders, just like you said, this is spiritual warfare. There is good and there is bad. And I just want you all to know you're on the right side. And I appreciate you all. And um, you just made me stronger. You know, strength of my purpose. Because again, as first responders, sometimes you think you're alone. The first responder family, police officers die at their own hand more than the bad guys or car chases by a lot. So you're helping to strengthen me so I can go out help strengthen my first responders and let them know we're not alone because we have brilliant brothers and a solid foundation that we have in um, 12th Baptist that's helping us all be the best we can. So thank you. Not as eloquent as you brothers, but speaking from passion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you um, Commissioner Gross. Um, you know, I, I would be remiss if at this time I wouldn't stop and ask someone to pray for the commissioner uh, because he does not have an easy job. You know, as, as, as his, his three bullets to me were being transparent, um, um, uh, being um, an educator and, and communicating. And, and that never grows old. When we stop doing it, when we, we be comfortable with having someone else do it, 
we have more problems. So I, I'm just going to ask uh, Reverend Bodrick to pray for Commissioner Gross. Thank you, and thank you, Commissioner. And, uh, thank you. Let's go to God in prayer. Most gracious God, you know all that we think and all that we feel. And God, we come right now as brothers to lift up our brother, our commissioner, Willie Gross. God, you know the great task that you've placed him in position to manage and handle. And God, you even more so know the various dynamics that he deals with. God, we heard him on this day. There are times he feels alone, times he feels isolated, times he feels as if no one has his back. But God, we are praying that in those moments that he knows that there is a solid rock in Jesus Christ. God, that he knows that he has people who are praying for him and people who are, care about him and recognize the complexities of the work that he does. We know it's no easy task to be the first black commissioner of this great city. And so God, we're asking that wherever he's weak, God, you strengthen him. That wherever he's torn down, build him back up. And God, we are praying that as he walks, even in the valleys of life, Remind him that grace and mercy are attached to him. And so, God, we're thankful for his willingness to do community policing. We're thankful that you built him and made him wonderful to be able to serve in a time such as this. We're so grateful for his presence and willingness to build community. For the many a peace walks he's walked on with us or throughout the community with us. But well, many a times he stepped up to help provide for young people in our community and to give gifts and toys and to do work to treat, work to go beyond to build the church community relations. And God, we're asking right now that even in this moment, as we're dealing with police misconduct and police brutality, God, that he can continue to stand strong and to be able to speak truth to power, even in his position. And so, God, we are thankful for Brother Willie Gross. We're thankful as a family and as a church to pray over him and to give him all that he needs. Let him know that we are supporting him and that we are conversation partners with him. And God, let him know, God, that you will never leave him and you have never forsaken him. So, God, we pray for our brother. We ask that you continue to give him your peace. And God, we know that you would do what you always do best and be God in his life as you guide him, as he guides the police department of this city. We give up Willie Gross to you and we intercede on his behalf. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen, thank you. Amen. I appreciate it. Amen. Um, quick poll, amen. short poll, um, five, four, Three, two, one. Good numbers, good numbers. Thank you, brothers. We're, we're approaching the end of our time. We're not gonna um, um, go longer than we need. I um, just want to um, give out some information before I, I turn you over to our senior pastor for a closing. Um, if um, you want to get in touch with us, uh, you can go to our church website, 12th Baptist Church, tbcboston.org, tbcboston.org. Uh, if you'd like to email us, mensfellowship at tbcboston.org. I took uh, notes. <laughs> Good. I took notes too. Uh, so if you want to reach out to us, please do that and um, um, do that. We would appreciate it. All the people who, who were, uh, were attendees will be receiving a link from Zoom to be able to uh, watch this again on demand. Uh, we encourage you to download it and circulate it um, because this is very powerful. This is a, a living testimony. Um, without um, any further ado, uh, thanking all of the panelists. 
um, and I'm introducing our senior pastor, Reverend Arthur T. Gerald. He is the 13th senior pastor of the historic 12th Baptist Church. He served for over 55 years uh, as a, a ministerial leader there. And he's a pastor with a living passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He lives and moves to develop the salvation in the community and in people, and is married with two grown children. Without any further ado, I'd like to um, ask our senior pastor for some closing remarks and to close us in prayer, and um, thanking everyone for this time. Reverend Gerald, we appreciate you. Uh, certainly, thank you, Brother Burton. Uh, don't, don't cut my time short at 12. It's 60 plus. I, I knew it was something like this. Sorry. Plus, don't cut me short. Uh, what uh, you no, mean? I, I want my full pension. <laughs> um, certainly to my beloved brother, who I've uh, dealt with for many years, even before he became commissioner of police in, in uh, Boston. Um, Commissioner Willie Gross, I, I thank you for your words. I thank you for your stature. I thank you for your passion for this city. And it, we, we shared with you in some, some of your dark moments, as I recall, when you were thinking about doing some things. But, but we're grateful that uh, things have come to a manner which you have been elevated to the commissioner's position and you're the best commissioner that we've ever had in Boston. Thank you. I still have work to do. You might we hear. All, we, we all do, brother. And you know, <laughs> you know, I'll be there at your side. Thank you. And if, if you haven't been in his office, I've been in his office on several occasions, but in his office which, where he's at now, he's got a picture of me in that office with him when he was uh, installed as the uh, commissioner. And that was a pivotal, very blessed moment for me to be there on that occasion. So I thank you, my brother. And to all of the panelists today, you each had something to say that has touched my spirit. And my beloved, let us not draw back, but let us stand firm and push forward because there's much for each of us and all of us to do in ministry. You've got, a, you've got an assignment and fulfill it to the best of your ability to God. And for those of you that were watching and listening today, thank you for joining with us today. And we pray that you will join with us tomorrow, whether it's virtually or physically. We can only have 65 people in the sanctuary. But certainly you can join us on YouTube, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, whatever, all, all those other social media outlets that we're using to join with us as we conclude this men's weekend uh, on a celebrated worship time on Sunday. I'm going to defer from closing the prayer. I'm going to ask my other gifted associate, that's the Reverend Jeffrey L. Brown, who has been waging a war as a first responder in the streets oh, yeah. all over this nation and even other parts of the world. He is a first responder. He is the first to join with me in ministry as I became the senior pastor, a man that I met way back. But at that time, he was interested in trope, but there was too many too many people in the pulpit. He'd never get a chance to, uh, to share and to speak, but God moved everybody else out the way and made it a way so that when Jeffrey had left uh, out there at, uh, in Cambridge, uh, that he was able to come with us at 12 Baptist Church. And he's been a great support, a great assistant to me. And then, of course, Reverend Buck. I found them both in Cambridge, by the way. What? <laughs> But God, but Reverend Brown is going to close us out in prayer, please. Lord, have mercy. Shall we pray? God, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful event, this celebration of first responders in you, oh God. 
And we thank you, Lord, for every one of our presenters this afternoon and for how you inspired them, Lord, to be able to be an inspiration to us so that when we leave this moment, we'll be able to stand, we'll be able to move forward, we'll be able to endure as your servants. Lord, in this tumultuous world, we pray, God, that you will continue to raise up even more first responders, men and women of God who are willing to stand for you and to be able to face whatever comes in the name of Jesus. We thank you for our wonderful pastor. We thank you, Lord, for the 60 plus years. Make sure he gets the uh, pension, oh God. <laughs> and we pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless him, Lord, because even all the way to this moment, he continues to serve you and to serve you with all of his heart. We thank you, Lord, for our pastor elect, Lord, who will assume the position of senior pastor, Lord, um, in January. We pray, God, that you continue to undergird him, Lord, and prop him up on every leaning side, yeah. give vision, Lord, as we move forward into this century. And to my good friend, Commissioner Gross, we pray, God, that you continue to imbue him with wisdom and understanding and strength and power and leadership, Lord, as he helps lead the city in public safety so that we can all uh, figure out the right ways in which we can be neighbor to one another. And God bless us all as we move forward. Keep us until we meet us again. We pray this in Jesus' name and let everybody say amen. Amen. Amen.